Greetings, boils and ghouls. Tonight we're delving into the twisted tale of a town ensnared in secrets and superstitions. Join us as we venture into the heart of Hollow Creek, where legends come to life and nightmares prowl in the moonlit shadows. Our story, Skinwalker of Hollow Creek, is bound to send shivers down your spine and leave you gasping for more. So, gather round, my eerie enthusiasts, as we uncover the mysteries lurking in the darkness of this chilling enclave. And before we begin, don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell for all notifications of new content. Plus, for those who prefer to listen to our tales on the go, fear not. Every story is also available on all popular podcast platforms. Dr. Insomnia uploads new content every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so mark your calendars and prepare for a weekly dose of dread. Now, let's dive headfirst into the terror that awaits us in Hollow Creek. Ah, welcome, dear fiends, to a tale most macabre and chilling, spun from the darkest corners of the mind of Dr. Insomnia. In the shadowy embrace of the forest north of College Station, Texas, there lies a secluded town, a place shrouded in the whispers of the night and cloaked in the mysteries of the damned. This town, known to the unfortunate souls who dare reside within its bounds as Hollow Creek, harbors secrets darker than the deepest grave. Settled in the accursed 1800s, Hollow Creek is a town not just founded on soil, but on the very superstitions and legends that make your spine tingle with fear. The creek from which it derives its ominous name meanders through the town like a serpent, rumored to be cursed by forces beyond our comprehension, its waters as murky as the history it hides. Despite the semblance of quaint charm, with its feed store leading the townsfolk in an Easter parade as if to mock the shadow of death that looms over, and a clothing store selling handmade dresses and vintage retro clothing to the younger crowd, a sinister mystery pervades the air. Laughter and light-hearted banter, mere facades for the darkness that dwells in the heart of Hollow Creek. Looming at the edge of town is a lumber mill, the lifeline for most of its men, a place where they toil under the watchful eye of something unseen, providing for their families with every swing of the axe, unaware of the true cost of their labor. But hark, before the settlers, before the cursed creek and the eerie parade, the land was watched over by the Navajo Native American tribe. They knew of the darkness that lurked, speaking in hushed tones of where the skinwalker's path becomes evil, a phrase that chills to the bone, warning all of the malevolent spirits that tread upon this cursed earth. So, dear guests of Dr. Insomnia, venture not lightly into the tale of Hollow Creek, for within its shadows you may find more than just stories. You may find a reality from which there is no waking, a nightmare that clutches your soul with icy fingers. Welcome to Hollow Creek, where every whisper of the wind and babble of the creek tells a tale of horror waiting just for you. In the dim glow of dusk, a car races up I-45 North, its speakers blaring classic rock anthems into the night. The interior is a chaos of Red Bulls, discarded cigarette packs, junk food wrappers, and a lone day pack amidst the refuse. Behind the wheel is Alex Carrasco, grizzled, unshaven, a shadow of his former self. Once a journalist chasing stories with fervor, he now chases ghosts of opportunities lost, his career a casualty to dead ends. Alex is on a journey not just through the miles, but into the past he's long tried to outrun. His destination is his late mother's home, a place filled with memories and now regret. His task is to pack up her life, a duty he carries out with a heavy heart, marked by the shame of his absence at her funeral. This drive is more than a return. It's a confrontation with his own failures, 
each mile a reminder of the roads not taken. Alex's roots trace back to Hollow Creek, where childhood was intertwined with the sawdust and sweat of working alongside his father, Jose. This labor was his rite of passage, a bridge to a future beyond the creek's confines. With every paycheck saved, he inched closer to college, to a world unfettered by the hum of the lumber mill that his father revered. Departing Hollow Creek for academia marked the last time Alex crossed its borders. His father's disappointment was palpable, a heavy fog of unspoken words and shattered expectations. Jose saw his son's ambitions as flights of fancy, a betrayal of family legacy and the hard, honest work of the mill. In leaving, Alex didn't just chase his dreams. He navigated a rift that time has yet to mend. Rolling into Hollow Creek, Alex comes to a halt at the town's solitary traffic light, a reminder of its small-scale charm. Beside him, the growl of an overgrown pickup slices through the quiet, its presence as imposing as its driver's past transgressions. It's Rodney, the high school tormentor, whose shadow loomed large over Alex's youth. Their history is marred by a particularly brutal encounter down by the creek, a haunt for the town's wayward teens. It was there amid the haze of rebellion and the laughter of peers that Rodney unleashed his cruelty, leaving Alex with not just a broken arm, but a scarred spirit. This unexpected reunion at the crossroads is a stark reminder of the battles Alex has faced and the demons he carries with him back into Hollow Creek. Oh shit! It's Big City over there! Rodney bellows. Alex's instinct was to shut Rodney out, to roll up the window and create a barrier between himself and the ghost of his past aggressions. But fate, it seemed, had a cruel sense of irony. The window button was broken a stubborn testament to his desire to escape unscathed. Trapped in a moment he'd rather flee, Alex was forced to confront the presence of Rodney, a living reminder of a time he wished remained buried. What's wrong? Run out of money and come home with your tail tucked between your legs? Like some old mangy dog, oh, that's your new man, mange. Rodney taunts. Alex's grip on the steering wheel tightens, his breaths quickening, a silent battle cry against the surge of old fears. As the light flickers to green, a signal to move forward, Rodney and his cohorts execute a swift blockade, their intentions as clear as the malice in their eyes. With no route for escape and faced with the inevitable confrontation, Alex steps out of the car. In this moment, he stands not just on the asphalt of Hollow Creek, but at the crossroads of facing his past aggressions head on. I don't want no. Alex's words hang in the air, a plea left unfinished as the sudden wail of a police siren slices through the tension. The scene is abruptly joined by Sheriff Langley, Jim Langley, a familiar face from Alex's high school days and a friend amidst the foes. The timely arrival shifts the dynamics of the confrontation introducing a glimmer of hope for Alex in an otherwise dark tableau. Boys, we got a problem? Langley asks. No problem, Sheriff, Rodney asserts with a grin, his demeanor shifting seamlessly to one of innocence, as if the air between them held no tension, no malice. This charade, a thinly veiled attempt to mask the aggression just moments from eruption, paints a picture of calm where there was none, a performance for the benefit of authorities' watchful eyes. Just wanted to say hi to my old buddy, Rodney claims, his tone dripping with feigned camaraderie as he and his posse retreat to their truck. As they make their departure, a moment of silent communication passes between Alex and Rodney. With a wink and a laugh, Rodney's mockery is clear, a taunt carried on the breeze as he drives away leaving Alex in the wake of a confrontation averted yet deeply felt. Man of all the people I thought I would see, Jim gives a bear hug to his old buddy. Thanks, man. I'd like to say it's good. Alex begins, his gratitude mingling with the weight of unspoken emotions, but he's cut off by Jim's interjection. No need. We all love Jenny. 
Your mama was the best, Jim interjects, his words a balm to the wounds of Alex's guilt and grief. The exchange, brief yet meaningful, culminates in a handshake, a gesture of mutual respect and shared sorrow. After a moment of connection in the midst of Hollow Creek's silent streets, they part ways, each to his own journey. Alex, with a heart heavy yet lightened by the encounter, turns towards his mother's house, stepping into the echoes of his past one last time. Later that night, Alex seeks solace in the amber glow of whiskey, the haunting melodies of Kind of Blue filling the air, a tribute to his dad's favorite record. As he attempts to unwind, to let the day's tensions dissolve into the music and the night, a subtle, unmistakable sound intrudes upon his solitude, the creaking of the porch outside. Hey, must be the house, he muses, attributing the noise to the age of the building. His parents had inherited it from his family, a legacy dating three generations back. The creaking pierces the silence once more, prompting Alex to set his glass down and approach the door, a bridge between the sanctuary of his home and the unknown of the night. As he peers into the darkness, finding no one, the moment hangs suspended, a whisper of history in the quiet. With a shrug, Alex retreats from the threshold, leaving the mystery of the empty porch behind as he steps back into the echoes of his family's past. Probably the whiskey, he laughs to himself. Then comes the unmistakable sound of scratching at the door. With a swift turn, Alex's curiosity transforms into action as he jerks the door open, bracing for an encounter. Yet, what greets him is not what he expects, but rather the absence of anything at all. No cause for the sound, no explanation for the disturbance. This eerie silence where anticipation meets emptiness adds another layer to the night's unsettling mystery. Jesus, go to bed, Alex says to himself, shaking his head. Overcome by the night's strangeness and the weight of his return, Alex stumbles to his room, succumbing to sleep's embrace the moment his head meets the pillow. The veil of slumber, however, is thin. Later, his eyes flick open, a silent ceiling greeting his gaze. As he shifts his view towards the bathroom door, a black silhouette arrests his attention, a figure distinct yet indistinct rooted in the shadows. Yet, Alex's heart does not race with fear. There's an inexplicable calm in his veins. Approaching with a hand that seems to breach the darkness with a soft, glowing light, the figure draws nearer. And then, as it leans closer, a visage comes into focus under the halo of its luminance. His father. Not just any memory of him, but his deceased father, standing there as if time and the finality of death had loosened their grip. Why weren't you there? You could have helped, the figure speaks its voice a blend of sorrow and accusation. In a haunting gesture of intimacy and reprimand, it reaches out, scratching Alex's face with its nails, a touch that conveys a deep-seated anguish and a longing for what could have been. This spectral encounter, bridging the realms of the living and the departed, leaves Alex in a moment suspended between confrontation and revelation. Alex jerks awake, a sudden rush pulling him from the depths of his nightmare into the stark, sweat-drenched reality of his room. With his heart pounding, he stumbles to the bathroom in search of solace in a simple glass of water. Yet, as he glances at the mirror, a routine double-take morphs into disbelief. There, on his face, is a scratch, a tangible mark that blurs the lines between the nightmare's fiction and his waking world leaving him to question the boundaries of his own reality. What the hell? Alex mutters, his voice a mix of confusion and alarm. He rubs the side of his face, leaning closer to the mirror for a better look. The scratch, undeniably real and inexplicably present, stands as a stark reminder of the nightmare's visceral grip on him, challenging the norms of what should be possible in the waking world. The next morning, amidst the task of packing, a knock at the door interrupts Alex's focused solitude. He opens it to find Lydia standing there, a figure from his past enveloped in the light of the present day. She was his high school flame, a person intertwined with memories of youth and what might have been, 
now standing on his doorstep, bridging years of silence with a single unexpected visit. I waited as long as I could, Lydia says. Waiting on what? Alex asks. Waiting on you to actually call or something. I don't know, Lydia shrugs. He smiles awkwardly and looks down. I'm not back. I'm just packing up the house and selling it, Alex offers. Lydia looks down and smiles, now the awkward one. Have you eaten? Lydia asks. Not yet, Alex says. Let's go to Betty's, Lydia exclaims. Betty's had been their sanctuary, a haven of youthful dreams and romance. It was the setting of their first date, a common ground for their peers, and the celebratory gathering place after the high school football games that lit up their small town. Their reunion unfolds beautifully, as if no time had passed, filled with shared memories and laughter. Energized by the day's warmth, Lydia and Alex return to the house, dedicating themselves to the task of packing, their efforts stretching deep into the night. You can stay if you want, Alex offers. Lydia grins. A little presumptuous of you, don't you think? I'll take the couch, he says. They both laugh, and she smiles. That night, as both succumb to the exhaustion of the day, the silence is pierced by an ethereal sound. Lydia stirs, her sleep disturbed by a voice emanating from the porch. It's soft, almost imperceptible, akin to a high, squeaky whisper that seems to dance on the edge of reality. At the same moment, Alex is jolted awake from his makeshift bed on the couch. Lydia emerges from his parents' bedroom, drawn by the curious sound their paths converging in a shared moment of nighttime vigilance. Do you hear that? Alex asks. Yeah, I thought it was just me, Lydia says. Alex, propelled by a mix of apprehension and curiosity, makes his way to the door. With a cautious eye, he peers through the peephole, expecting perhaps a shadow of the night or a trick of the light. Instead, what he sees grips his heart with a chilling clarity. It's his mother, his dead mother standing on the porch, as real and as present as the night around him. Let me in, Alex. I've lost my key, she says. He turns to Lydia, his eyes wide with a mix of sheer terror and confusion. The sight before him, unbelievable and haunting, has rendered him speechless, seeking in Lydia's gaze a semblance of understanding perhaps a confirmation that he's not alone in this moment of surreal encounter. Yes, I heard it too. That's not your mother. I went to the funeral. It was open casket. I know it isn't her. Lydia gasps. Alex? Alex? Please let me in. Alex? Are you there? Go away. You are not my mother. Alex, why didn't you come to my funeral? Lydia and Alex stand motionless a paralyzing fear enveloping them both. In this shared moment of dread, they are united, each grappling with the surreal and terrifying reality before them, unable to move, speak, or react. Alex? The voice, initially so familiar, twists into something unrecognizable, a distortion that chills to the bone, making it undeniably clear. This thing was not his mother. Armed with a resolve hardened by fear, Alex returns, clutching a butcher knife with a trembling hand. With a swift motion fueled by both desperation and hope, he jerks the door open, only to be met with nothing. The porch lies empty, the night silent once more, as if the encounter were nothing but a shared hallucination. He closes the door, the finality of the action doing little to ease the tension that clings to the air. Together, they spend the rest of the night awake, their conversation sporadic, punctuated by stretches of silence. Each is wrapped in their own disbelief, grappling with the reality of what they both heard, a shared experience that defies explanation. The next day finds them at Betty's, a place once brimming with memories of simpler times, now a quiet refuge for two souls unsettled by the night's eerie events. They sit together, cups of coffee in hand, their appetites lost to the shadows of disbelief and fear. The familiar faces of the Hollow Creek Police Department are there as well, 
a semblance of normalcy in a world that feels anything but. It's in this muted atmosphere that Jim Langley, a bridge to both past and present, approaches and takes a seat at Lydia and Alex's table, his presence a silent acknowledgement of the unspoken tensions that hang between them. So I guess you guys know, Langley says. Know what? Lydia asks. Rodney and all his boys, all dead, Langley whispers. What? Jesus Christ, Alex exclaims. Yeah, we're not really sure. Looks like some animal attacked them. We don't think it was an animal in some ways, though. They were all attacked inside their own trailers. They all had claw marks that each either had four or five marks in them. The coroner speculates the one missing intermittently looks like a thumb. Most animals don't have thumbs like that, Jim offers. I have to ask, Alex, due to your relationship with Rodney and the boys, where were you last night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m.? Lydia interrupts. I was with him at his mom and dad's place, helping pack. Oh, Jim says awkwardly. We were packing the house up to sell, Alex says. Yeah. Packing. Langley leans back, slightly grinning. Lydia rolls her eyes, laughing. Lydia and Alex wrap up their quiet contemplation at Betty's and make their way back to the house. As they draw near, a chilling detail arrests their attention. The door bears marks unmistakable in their intent. Five claw marks etched into the wood. With a single look exchanged between them, no words are necessary. Both understand the grim significance of this sign, a tangible echo of the night's terror, silently affirming the reality of their shared fear. As the day unfolds, Lydia and Alex find themselves immersed in the task at hand, packing up more of the house. Despite the morning's unsettling discovery, they press on, the act of sorting through memories and belongings, offering a semblance of normalcy in the wake of the night's eerie events. I can stay again, but I need some clothes, Lydia offers, breaking the rhythm of their packing with a practical concern. You can use my mom's stuff. I think there are some jeans and tees in her room, Alex responds, his voice carrying a mix of gratitude and a willingness to share what's left of his family's life with her. Thanks. You can take the bed as well, Alex adds, extending his hospitality further, showing care in his own way. You could join me, Lydia suggests with a smile, hinting at a deeper connection, a shared comfort amidst the chaos. I'm going to go shower. You could join me there too if you want. Lydia's smile broadens, her invitation clear, blending vulnerability with the strength found in their rekindled closeness. Without a word, Alex and Lydia walk towards the shower together, their actions speaking volumes about the trust and intimacy being rebuilt between them in the face of shared fears and uncertainties. Later that night, they find solace beneath the blankets their conversation meandering between talks and laughter, a lightness amidst the shadows that have enveloped their return to Hollow Creek. I'll get a plumber for that shower. It needs unclogging to sell the house, Alex remarks, thinking aloud about the practicalities of preparing the house for sale and attempt to anchor himself in the reality of the tasks ahead. Yeah, you could stay in, Lydia begins, her words drifting into silence laden with unspoken thoughts and possibilities. Lydia, I didn't mean to. Alex starts, his response cut short, a moment of vulnerability interrupted. I have no expectations, I was just saying. Lydia interjects quickly, her words a gentle reassurance, a way to ease any tension, making clear her presence is one of support, not expectation, as they navigate the complexities of their rekindled connection. The next day unfolds with the arrival of the plumber, his presence in the bathroom marking the beginning of a long day's work. From early morning until the veil of night begins to descend, he toils away, a testament to the challenges hidden within the house's aging pipes. I can fix it, but I need some more tools, he says. I'll be back tomorrow to finish, he says. Alex nods as the plumber sees himself out. Later that night, amidst the warmth of a crackling fire, 
Alex and Lydia find themselves enveloped in the comfort of each other's company, sipping whiskey and wine. The air is filled with the timeless notes of milestones, echoing from one of his dad's cherished records, a backdrop to their shared moment of tranquility. Suddenly, the serenity is broken by a knock at the door. I'm back to fix your shower, announces the voice from outside, unexpected and out of place in the late hour. He said he wouldn't be back until tomorrow, Alex responds with a shrug, perplexed by the untimely return. He sounds weird, Lydia observes, a hint of unease coloring her words. He's probably drunk. It's late. Alex laughs it off, trying to dispel the tension with humor, yet the oddity of the situation hangs in the air, an unsettling interruption to their peaceful evening. Alex approaches the door, curiosity and caution mingling in his steps. Upon opening it, he's met with the plumber's figure looming at the threshold, an odd hesitation marking his entrance. With a welcoming gesture, Alex invites him in, unaware of the looming dread. Come on in, man, he says, a simple invitation that quickly spirals into chaos. As the figure steps into the light, Lydia's scream pierces the night, a chilling prelude to horror unveiled. The plumber's right hand, no longer human, brandishes five elongated claws, a nightmarish transformation. He lunges towards Alex, who narrowly escapes the swipe, instinctively darting towards the kitchen. Run, Lydia! Alex's voice is a mix of fear and urgency, a desperate plea as the night turns from tranquility to terror. Armed with a butcher knife, Alex faces the monstrous intruder, determination fueling his defense. With a swift motion, he slashes, tearing through the man's coverall sleeve and into the flesh beneath. The fabric gives way to reveal not skin, but a gray-brown hide, oozing black at the sight of the wound. The creature's response is a deep, primal roar, a sound no human could produce as it throws its head back in anguish. Alex aims another strike, but the creature, with an agility that belies its form, evades and flees into the enveloping darkness of the night, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions. The open door serves as its escape, swallowing it whole into the night's abyss. Alex stands, knife still in hand, dripping with the creature's black ichor as the Hollow Creek Police Department arrives, summoned by Lydia's quick thinking. Officers disperse, combing the area for any sign of the assailant. Sheriff Langley makes his way to the porch, where Alex and Lydia have sought refuge in the aftermath. Their silhouettes, shadowed under the porch light, paint a picture of resilience in the face of unimaginable terror. You two okay? Langley's voice cuts through the lingering tension, a welcome presence in the aftermath of chaos. They nod in unison, their silent affirmation belying the turmoil still gripping their minds. Do you think it was who got Rodney? Langley probes, seeking insight into the night's horrors. Yes, Alex whispers, haunted by the echoes of terror that still reverberate within him. What got Rodney? Lydia interjects, a correction that highlights the gravity of their situation. Langley's response is a measured silence, his gaze shifting briefly over his notepad, absorbing the weight of their words without comment. It had claws on its right hand, Lydia offers, her voice trembling with the memory of the creature's grotesque features. It was probably a glove. You guys are in shock, Langley offers, attempting to rationalize the inexplicable with a dose of practicality. How do you explain that stuff over there on the knife? Alex demands, his disbelief punctuated by the evidence still clinging to the blade. Jim Langley's eyes widen as they fall upon the knife, a silent acknowledgement of the horror that lurks beyond the realm of rational explanation. We saw some of this goop at Rodney's trailer, too. We thought it might be part of their meth lab, Langley exclaims, his attempt to bring a semblance of order to the chaos that surrounds them. Lydia, I think you should stay here. It's safer in numbers, Alex suggests, his concern for her safety palpable in his words. Lydia nods in agreement, acknowledging the wisdom in his suggestion. They sit together most of the night in silence, and most of the day, Alex offers, 
highlighting the solemn bond forged by shared trauma and the need for companionship in the face of fear. It seems this thing comes at night, Lydia alludes. They are called skinwalkers, dating back to the Navajo when they were here. Remember, my mother was Navajo. Supposedly, the only way they can enter a home is if they are invited. The only way to kill it is by saying its name, Skinwalker in this case before striking. The Navajo use their language, but there is no reason English would not work. It obviously knows English. It pretended to be your mother, Lydia states, her voice carrying the weight of ancient knowledge and ancestral warnings. My father, too. It was in my dreams, Alex adds, a shiver running down his spine as he points to the scratch on his face. Lydia nods solemnly. They work their prey in their dreams first to try to lure them out of the house. If you had left looking for him, it would have killed you that night. Alex stares at her in terror and silence, the gravity of her words sinking in. Why didn't you tell Langley about all of this? He finally asks, his voice tinged with frustration and desperation. Hollow Creek treats Navajo like we're all crazy witches. The last thing I want is to make that worse, Lydia responds, her words laced with resignation, a reflection of the harsh realities they face in a town steeped in superstition and fear. Alex nods in silent agreement, a sense of determination settling over him as they brace themselves for whatever may come next. Another knock at the door draws their attention, and Alex's gaze shifts to Lydia, who now holds his father's double-barrel 12-gauge shotgun, a symbol of their readiness to confront the unknown. With a shared resolve, Alex moves to open the door, his eyes meeting Langley's as the barrier between them gives way. Without a word, Langley acknowledges Lydia's preparedness, a silent nod of understanding that speaks volumes. Seeing this, Lydia lowers the shotgun, the tension in the room easing slightly as they await the next twist in their harrowing ordeal. Just wanted to check on you guys before I head home. Everything good? Langley asks, his gaze lingering on Lydia, who still holds the shotgun, a striking image juxtaposed against the backdrop of the cowboy sheriff hat he holds in his hand. Just then, the tranquility of the moment is shattered by the sudden intrusion of blue and red lights flashing through the windows. The shrill blare of a bullhorn from one of the cars outside jolts them into a heightened state of alertness, a stark reminder of the outside world's intrusion upon their sanctuary. Lydia, Alex, that is not me. Langley's voice reverberates from outside, amplified by the bullhorn's blare, a proclamation that cuts through the chaos like a clarion call. The urgency in his tone is palpable, a plea for understanding amidst the confusion that grips them all. Lydia, her resolve unwavering, raises the gun once more, its weight a testament to the seriousness of their situation. With a steady hand, she holds it aloft, a silent declaration of their readiness to defend themselves against whatever may come. I don't know what is going on, but obviously I am me. Inside, Langley chuckles, his attempt to lighten the tension palpable even through the bullhorn's distortion. Despite the uncertainty that surrounds them, his voice carries a reassurance, a beacon of stability in the storm of confusion. Show me your right arm, Lydia demands, her eyes piercing as they remain fixed on Langley, a demand born of necessity in the face of uncertainty. Come on, Lydia, he protests, a note of urgency in his voice as he tries to dissuade her from her demand. Show me, she yells her voice rising with determination, fueled by the need for answers in the face of danger. Alex, all the while, holds the butcher knife in hand, his grip tight with readiness. Reluctantly, Langley raises his sleeve, revealing a scar, a detail that only serves to deepen the mystery surrounding him. I knew it, she declares her voice firm as she points the shotgun directly at him, her resolve unyielding. Alex, you know when I got that, it was when... He is interrupted by Lydia's piercing scream. Skinwalker, she cries out, her terror evident as the creature reveals itself, a sinister transformation that defies comprehension. With lightning speed, 
two buckshots ring out, tearing through the creature's chest and cutting it in half. Langley, now gone, leaves behind a whitish-gray, goblin-like creature in his place, its upper torso struggling to crawl towards Alex. In a desperate act of survival, Alex yells, Skinwalker! as he drives the knife into its brain, silencing the creature's screams once and for all. At that moment, Langley and two deputies approach the doorstep, guns drawn. They gently take the shotgun from Lydia, who is in shock, and escort Alex and Lydia out to the front yard for their statements. Guys, I'll bury this. No need to go through the persecution of being accused of lying or making up some crazy story. I believe you guys. I saw it, and even I am having a hard time believing it. It was an animal attack. That's it, that's all, Langley affirms with wide eyes and nodding, expecting agreement. Lydia and Alex make eye contact and nod, holding back tears, a silent understanding passing between them. Thank God it's over, Alex whispers, relief evident in his voice. Lydia looks down, holding in a whimper, her composure wavering under the weight of the ordeal they've just faced. They always travel in packs, Lydia whispers, always. Well, my intrepid fright seekers, that concludes our bone-chilling journey into the heart of Hollow Creek and the sinister secrets that lie within. I hope you enjoyed our hair-raising adventure. But before we part ways, don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell for all notifications of new content. And for those who prefer to experience our tales in the dark of night, remember that all stories are available on all popular podcast platforms. Dr. Insomnia releases new content every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so be sure to mark your calendars and brace yourselves for a weekly dose of terror. Until next time, my sinister subscribers, stay frightful, and remember to keep your eyes peeled for the things that go bump in the night.